Sir Gawain, sometimes pronounced Gawain, and the Green Knight has been a popular focus of Arthurian myth long before the making of the recent Green Knight film. It is significant precisely because of its particularity, which certainly belies its ancient foundations. Yet Arthurian myth is in fact one of the most difficult onions to unravel in terms of meaning, because it often appears that medieval writers had really no idea what they stood for. Arthurian myth is generally speaking medieval fiction, written by people who draw upon folk tales and pagan mythology, weaving myth, history, and fiction in order to form their tales. It creates a tangled web of connections which often unravels into overlapping nonsense when you pull upon a loose thread. There are reflections of earlier myths there, but they're not always easy to understand because of their synthetic nature. This is also the case with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Elements of the tale can be traced to several different Welsh and Irish sources, perhaps not all of which were originally part of the same story. Or were they? As we pull back the layers of the Green Knight, surprises may await us. We will attempt to plunge into its most ancient depths to find the original meaning in its most ancient motifs. Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. I'd like to give a big thanks to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Perhaps the best place to start into the tale is with Sir Gawain himself. He was believed most often to be the son of Lot, king of Lothian, and is often also king of Orkney and sometimes Norway. He is brother-in-law to King Arthur, married to his sister Morgays, or Anna. In Geoffrey of Monmouth's history, he was named Ludonus, King of Ludonia, and in Welsh versions, as Llydon, and Welsh Arthurian sources, as Lle, a name identical with the earlier god Lu. Lothian or Ludonia is also possibly derived from an earlier Lugudoniana, the place of the fortress of Lu, sharing a common name with various sites in Britain, Ireland, Gaul, and this channel. While it is possible that King Lot is reflective of a true historical king, it may also be that he has become conflated with an earlier deity. As we shall see, the most important mythological element in the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is exactly cognate with an Irish story told of Cúchulainn, a hero said to be the son of the god Lug. So this connection between Lot and Lug may be more than a coincidence. Lot is also represented in the story of St. Kentigern. There he is named Llaethon, a king and the grandfather of the saint, who was a pagan lord but one extremely committed to enforcing the law, especially chastity, so much so that he had his own pregnant daughter thrown from the heights of Trapran Law for her extramarital deeds. King Lot's attributed arms even happens to be a raven or crow, Gawain is the son of King Arthur's sister, and Lot, and in early works is often one of King Arthur's most trusted knights, the highest of the elite round table, often used as a symbol of chivalry, and also a figure known for love and mastery of speech. In Welsh, his name is Gwachme. We may find the same dynamic represented in Irish myth. Cúchulainn is the son of the sister of King Conhovar of Ulster. He is the strongest warrior and closest ally, and takes a seat within his round house, where all the chief warriors of the Red Branch have their place. The Red Branch is the name of an elite group of warriors who serve Conhovar. Many medieval tales focus on these warriors, including the most famous Gaelic epic, the Tanbo Cúlignam. This would perhaps be easy to write off as coincidence, save for the tale of the Green Knight closely resembles Brickru's feast in several ways. In the English tale of the 14th century, a great feast is being held at New Year's. In the midst of the party, in rides a strange knight, all in green. Even his skin is green. He puts forward a bizarre challenge to King Arthur, smite him down with an axe and then let him take a blow in return. Gawain leaps forward to defend the king from this challenge, taking it upon himself. 
and Gowan delivers a great blow, severing the head and sending it rolling across the floor of the court. Yet the Green Knight walks forward and takes up the head in his arms. Mounting his horse, he tells Gowan that on the next New Year's, he must seek him out at his green chapel in order to receive the return blow, and then rides away without telling him where to find it. Gowan waits out most of the year in the court of King Arthur, but as the season draws into autumn, he departs to seek for the location of the Green Knight in order to fulfill his end of the challenge. He seeks far and wide, explicitly naming the Isle of Mona as one of his destinations, yet no one there has any news of the location of the Green Knight or his chapel. Then he comes across a mysterious castle and spends several days there. He swears an oath to the Lord to rest in bed in his castle while he goes out hunting during the day. But each night they would exchange what they had won. Gowan won kisses from the Lord's wife while resisting her temptations. These he renders up to her husband, but he did not render the final gift, a green silk sash which he vowed to keep while he was able to resist the temptations presented by the wife of the Lord within, he was not able to overcome the final temptation, the promise that the silk sash would save his life. He is finally led to the Green Knight, who is a giant living in some overgrown ruins. He must lay down and offer up his neck. Two strikes are feigned, while the final one cuts him slightly, at which point the Hurl proclaims that the test is complete and that he was the Lord who had hosted him at his house. He had asked his wife to test him, and he cut him on the last strike because he had retained the silk. But nevertheless, he proclaims that he is the greatest knight he has ever seen. This beheading myth is very similar to that found in the Irish myth Brickru's Feast. That tale actually contains two episodes of this beheading game, but the tale appears to be comprised of two separate versions combined into one. In the first part, the King of Ulster, Conhovar, sends Loigara, Conalcernach, and Cúchulainn to be judged by Ua, son of Imowen. That translates roughly as Phantom Son of Terror. He was said to have great magical powers and was able to take on any form. They went to his lake and told him that they had come to be judged by him, and he makes them swear to obey his judgments, which they agree to. He then says that he has a bargain for them. He has an axe, and he would like them to cut off his head one day, and then allow him to cut off theirs the next. In some versions, Loigara and Connell accept, take the head off Ua, but when they realize he doesn't die, they flee. It is Cúchulainn who fulfills the bargain, keeping his word, his contract. He takes the head of Ua and then returns to receive his counter blow the following day. However, Ua turns the blade and does not kill him. In the other beheading episode, it is much more similar to that recorded in the English tale. In the night, during a great feast, when all were making merry, a hurl strides in, his head reaching the roof. Though he is not called green, he nevertheless has vegetative elements. He carries a large tree in his hand as a club, and an axe in the other. His hair is also called a tree or bush. When asked what he is doing there, he says that he has a challenge, but he exempts Conhovar and Fergus from it because of their status as kings. He challenges the warriors to allow him to take their head so that they will take his on the morrow. With no takers, he agrees to reverse the bargain so that they may strike him first. All the chief warriors then do so, but they all fail to show themselves the next day when it's their turn to receive the blow. Finally, Cúchulainn agrees to take the challenge, but unlike the others, he returns the following day and stretches his neck out on the block, accepting his death. The sound of the hurl then is likened to the sound of a forest on a windy night. He brought the axe down, but just like Ua, the blade is turned up. 
He then tells Cuchulain to rise and proclaims him the chief warrior of all Ireland, and we are told that the Hurl was in fact Cúroi in disguise, and very likely so is a figure called Ua. The name Cúroi means hound of the field, and he is strongly associated with the spirit world, and is likely a euhemerized god of the underworld. Setting itself apart from the Gaelic tale, however, the Green Knight tells an extended story of Gawain's quest to find the knight again on New Year's, and his strange stay at the mysterious castle where he is tempted for several days in a row by the wife of the Lord. In the tale of Cúchulain, there is also an episode where they go to find Cúroi, and end up staying at Cúroi's house with his wife there, and he is not present. So there are elements that still link up to this, but the dynamic plays out somewhat differently. And so a major theme that differs between the two tales is that in the English tale, Gawain is tested in terms of his morality, in terms of his ability to resist the sexual temptations of the Lord's wife. While this feature is not present in the Irish myth, Things like this do show up in a Welsh tale in the Mabinogi. Pwyth, the Prince of David, ends up trading places with Araun, the king of the underworld, for a year. In that time, Pwyth lays in the same bed with, but is never intimate with the wife of Araun. He must then deliver a single blow to Havgan, the enemy of Araun, for a second strike would revive him. After the ordeal, Araun is impressed with Pwith and awards him many great gifts. In the tale of Thay and Blodaiwith, Thay's wife betrays him while he's away. Thay is then killed, but returns a year later to deliver the same deadly blow back to his killer. Though not associated with decapitation, the element of the seduction and the suggestion of an annual death and rebirth are present in both. Though not contained within Brickru's feast, there is a further narrative that takes place between Cúchulain and Cúroi. Cúchulain was said to have fallen in love with Blanat, but Cúroi won her as war booty when they raided the Isle of Man. Cúchulain is then humiliated by Cúroi when he challenges him in a fight. And later, Cúchulain woos Blanat and gets her to betray her husband. She informs Cúchulain of the secret way that Cúroi can be killed, and she alerts Cúchulain and the rest of the Ulster forces after she has tricked Cúroi and rendered him helpless. Cúchulain then kills Cúroi and claims his wife, but she then dies being dragged off a cliff by one of Cúroi's loyal men. This tale exactly corresponds to the Welsh story of Thay and Blodaiwith, though in this case, Cúchulain is not playing the role of Thay, but of Gronu Peber, the wooer of Blodaiwith, and the killer of Thay. In both the English, Welsh, and Gaelic tales that relate to the common theme, there is some involvement with the wife related to subduction. In the English tale, and the story of Pwyth, this takes the form of proving the virtue of the man, while in the Gaelic tale and the Welsh story of Thay, the wife is the source of competition and the cause of the death of the man. In both the story of Cúchulain and the story of Gawain, the warrior proves himself by living up to his sworn word and by facing certain death without flinching under fear. The oath, the sworn word of the man, and the deal or bargain are important elements of the tale. The vow must be honored even though it is a vow that means certain death, and it is ultimately this which proves that the warrior is the most worthy of all. Before the final Roman battle with Caratacus, Tacitus says that he had all of his warriors swear an oath to their national god that they would neither back down nor surrender nor flinch from wounds in the combat, that they would fight without retreat. This myth seems to encapsulate this ancient warrior code. 
As Sir Gawain sets off to the chapel of the Green Knight, the poet invokes the season and the weather in a dramatic fashion, saying that at the new year, the daylight overtakes the night, as God bids, but that wild weather and storms also arise, and it snows as Gawain departs. Many have tried to read into the tale a grand pagan theme of the death of the old year, the cycle of regeneration of the sun, and these do seem to enter into elements of the poetry around it. Yet it seems to me that the most straightforward meaning is one which involves the ways in which a god and goddess can cast judgment upon warriors or even a future ruler. For there is yet another mysterious element left unsaid. At the end of the poem, the Green Knight reveals that his true name is Bernlach de Haut Desert. Bernlach may be cognate with Gaelic Bachlach, meaning a hurl, servant, labor, herder, which is the name that is given for the figure in the story of Cúchulainn, before we find out that his true name is Cúroi. While Haut Desert means high wasteland, high desert. Moreover, Morgan Le Fay dwells in his castle. She was the woman Gawain had seen with his wife, and the poem explains that she was the mistress of Merlin, who had learned all his powers, and that she had put him up to giving Gawain this test. It was she who had sent him to the castle of King Arthur with the challenge. The poem actually calls her a goddess, and likewise identifies her as Sir Gawain's aunt and half-sister to Arthur. Bernlach invites Gawain back to his house, but the knight will not return with him, but they part as friends. Of course, if Morgan is a goddess, then Arthur would be a god, and it would be very reasonable to assume that Morgan Le Fay is the same figure as Irish Morrigan, who also engages in strange tests of warriors. There is definitely connections between the tale of Sir Gawain and earlier mythology and that directly links to Gaelic mythology, perhaps even more so than it directly links to Welsh mythology, strangely enough. However, unlike the Gaelic myths of Cúchulainn and Conhovar, the Arthurian myths are likewise laced with later Christianity and Christian moral themes. While both Cúchulainn and Gawain are tested as warriors in nearly the same way, the character of the two are very different. There is hardly a trace of chivalry in the earliest tales of the Ulster Cycle. Cúchulainn does not prove himself under the terms of medieval chivalry, but under the warrior code common across most of Iron Age Europe. Despite this, the story of Gawain seems in some way to contain an equally archaic core overlaid by a few additional Christian themes. There seems no doubt that the two tales are of identical origin, but in some ways the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as preserved in English is a more coherent version the Gaelic version being a haphazard construct combining two different versions into one. We know that Welsh poets like Taliesin were aware of Gaelic stories because he includes figures like Cúchulainn and Cúroi in several poems, so it's possible that it made its way through Welsh into Old and Middle English, but possibly it comes directly from Gaelic. In the wooing of Ever, Cúchulainn is said to have been a foster son trained in poetry and speech by Ulvik and Saxa, meaning the little wolf of the Saxons. This may even be a reference to Woden, given his association to wolves and poetry. Yet this shows a medieval connection between Gaelic and Old English, and it is thought that some forms of Gaelic poetry are influenced by Old English forms. There are, of course, many readings to this myth. One is that the ability to face up to one's death is the ultimate requirement of the true warrior, and that this specific test is testing the word of the warrior, the oath of the warrior, 
that he will in fact face his death without flinching. And this is the same oath recorded in ancient sources that was said to be given by warriors before they went into battle. However, the other element is that the nature of the Green Knight does appear related to foliage in both Irish and English tales. Is the Green Knight then similar to the Green Man? It is difficult to say for sure, but he may be associated with the underworld and the earth as the hurlish figures tend to be in Celtic myth, which may also connect him with plants. He says that he learned magic from Morgan le Fay, a goddess likely cognate with the Morgan in Gaelic myth. She sent the Green Knight to test Gawain, and the Gaelic Morgan would often put young warriors to such potentially deadly tests. It may reflect a certain seasonal transition with the young hero god killing off the old year, which is a very common interpretation of the myth, but it seems at least in its current form to more directly reflect the proving of the champion, reinforcing the conception of the social role of the warrior who is ultimately tested against death by spiritual forces and whose proof as a serious warrior, namely an oath that he will not flinch or retreat from the foe. Tacitus says that the warriors of Caratacus made such a vow during their final confrontation with Rome, and that they swore it to their national god, very likely Mercury, Blue, or Woden. In the English tale, Gawain leaves the test successful, but with a green belt that served as a perpetual reminder that he was imperfect. The more Iron Age centered Gaelic tale, Cúhollán triumphs and is recognized as the greatest warrior of all Ireland, with no such precondition of humility or living with flaws. Gawain has acquired certain moral and religious obligations and conduct which are not ascribed to Cúhollán and early Gaelic heroes, and in this respect we can see the Christian influence as their conception of the ideal warrior was changed to fit within a Christian framework, but the origin of the tale is undoubtedly the same. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, a big thanks again to my Patreon and PayPal supporters, and if you send a donation through PayPal, as I have received some kind donations previously, I often wish to send a private message back to people who send in donations, but sometimes it has not been possible because the email address provided, um, I was not able to send a message back to it. Uh, and so, to those out there who have sent me donations, I do appreciate it, and I thank you very much. So, much thanks again to all of you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and as always, stand tall.